Okay. <coughs> Kedoshim. We're, we're a parsha behind Eretz Israel, And everybody wants to know when, when do we catch up? I'm not sure. No, we, you always have to have, there's, there's, a, there's a whole calculus. And one of the reasons that it happens is that you want, the Gemara says, certain parshiot have to be at certain times of the year. So Bamidbar has to be at the time of Shavuot, right before Shavuot. So how that works, I'm not sure. I'm, I'm not sure the calculus. I don't think it happens until we get into Chumash Bamidbar. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Bahar, but it's not Bahar Bechukotai. Bahar Bechukotai are not, are separate. So in Bamidbar, it's going to be in, yeah, it's going to be one of the parshiot in uh, Bamidbar. Okay, Kedoshim, page 656. Just to give you a sense of Kedoshim, let's, let's read a few of the psukim, as we usually do. Let me get this positioned. Okay. Kedoshim. Vayidabe Hashem, page 656. Vayidabe Hashem al Moshe Lemor. Shasen speaks to Moshe saying, Daber al kol adas b'nei Yisov amarta lahem, Kedoshim tiyu, ki kadosh ani Hashem, speak unto the entire assembly of the children of Israel, and say to them, you shall be holy. Right? Kedoshim tiyu, for I am kadosh. Eishimo, now, what happens in the next psukim? Eishimo v'aviv tiro v'shabtotai tishmoru, tishmoru ani Hashem lokechem. We're going to get pasuk by pasuk by pasuk with multiple mitzvot. Every man, your mother and your father shall you revere. So that's kibbutz avain. And my Shabbatot shall you observe. I am Hashem, your God. Next, al tifnu et et ha'elilim ve'elohei masecha lo tasu lachem ani Hashem lokechem. Do not turn to idols and molten gods. Shall you not make for yourselves? I am Hashem, your God. The chisis bechuzev achshlamim la Hashem l'tzon chem tis balchuhu. When you slaughter a feast, a, a shlomim, a feast offering to Hashem, you shall slaughter it to find favor for yourselves. Then it says, Yom Sitrachem Yeochelnim Imokarat. So when do you eat the shlomim? On the day of your slaughter shall it be eaten, and on the next day. So you have one, two days. Ajom Shlishi Ba'esh Yibanosar. And that which remains behind, whatever remains behind, Ajom Hashlishi until the third day. Ba'esh Yisaref. So now you're learning another halacha. Anything that remains behind by the third day by a shlamim, it gets burnt. The, but it shall be eaten on the third day. It is reject if it should be, but if you eat it when it should be burnt, it's called pigu. We're going to talk about that. It shall not be accepted. Another halacha. Each of those who eat, it will bear his iniquity. For what is sacred to Hashem, that has, been, has, has he desecrated. And that soul will be cut off from the people. Now we're told the punishment. It's kares if you eat it beyond its time. Another new, a new mitzvah. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not complete your reaping to the corner of your field, right? We're now going to learn about all of the all of the tzakot we do through the land. So peya leket shikha the chamecholo solo peret chamecholo salake v'ani v'lakir tasov tamani Hashem lokechem. All of these psukim, right? That you're learning all of the laws of the land. What has to be left over that you have to leave for the poor? Lo tignovu pasuk yud aleph. You shall not steal. You shall not deny falsely, and you shall not lie to another. You shall not swear falsely by my name. They uh, thereby desecrating the name of your God. You shall not cheat your fellow. You shall not rob him. You shall not rob him. You have to pay wages of a person who works for you, has to get paid before the nightfall, right? That's, what is that referring to? That's the halacha, if you have a worker for a day, he comes working for you for a day, a handyman should get paid right away. You don't make him wait. You shall not curse the deaf. 
you should not place a stumbling block before the blind. You shall fear your God. I am Hashem. That's just Rishon. That's all the. What do you get a sense here? Mitzvah after mitzvah after mitzvah. The Rub looks at these mitzvot and he wants to study each mitzvah that he's interested in, that he's going to focus on individually. He doesn't try to, there are some mitzvahim that are going to try to make a connection. Why does it flow like this through the parsha? They, they spend a lot of time trying to figure out why does it go one from one from one from one? No, the, the Rav is not interested in, it, in that per se. The Rav doesn't discuss that. The Rav just discusses the mitzvot and what we can learn from each mitzvah that he's focusing on. So let's begin at the very start. Kedoshim Tihiyu. What is Kedoshim Tihiyu? That is an introduction. It's an introduction to all of the mitzvot. It's not like the other sukim where you have an individual mitzvah. So we'll study each in mitzvah. No, this is an overarching introduction. Kedoshim to you. It's not telling you what to do. The, most of the psukim here are telling us what to do, correct? Kedoshim to you doesn't tell you what to do. What does it tell you? How to do it. The style of your observance. What is the style of your observance? It's Kedoshim. So it's the overarching statement, right? Put another way, it connects all of the mitzvot in this parsha. All of the mitzvot in this parsha, because what is it teaching us? Observance of mitzvot is the way to attain Kedusha. Of course, if you have the right mindset, if you have the right mindset, you will realize Kedoshim Tihiyu, the mitzvot are our way to connect to holiness to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And but you have to realize that the mitzvah is not just a mitzvah, it is the vehicle for Kedusha. That's very important. It is the vehicle. So again, the opening pasuk is totally different than the rest of the parsha. Rest of the parsha is individual psukim. Don't steal, don't do this, don't do this, do this, don't do that. Leave leka chikhan peha, all of these mitzvot, right? Filial responsibility, kibbut avaim is mentioned in here, Shabbos observance. Those are individual mitzvot. Kedoshim is an overarching introduction to the entire, to, to the entire Torah. So let's begin. What's the first pasuk that is going to start off the mitzvot? Pasuk imo. Ish imo. The Aviv Tirau, the Et Shabtotai Tishmoru. Okay, Ish Imova Aviv Tiro, the Shabtotai Tishmoru. This plus clearly connects filial responsibility, Kivud of Aim with what? The Shabbos. Now, I'm not going to discuss from a halachic perspective. Rav, the Rav doesn't address that. The Gemara addresses what does it mean? Why is Shabbos and Kivud of Aim connected? You know, if a parent tells you, to violate Shabbos, what are you supposed to do? You're not supposed to listen. Well, what happened to Kibbut Avaim? Because HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the parent of all of us. Correct? Oh, so the parent of all of us tells us, Ishimova Avitiro, that Shabbatai Shishmaru. That's perhaps one of the halachic questions. But the philosophically, what is your question when you read this passage? What does Shabbos and filial responsibility have to do with each other? In other words, what is the Torah teaching us by connecting Shabbos and Kibbut Avaim and filial responsibility? Furthermore, if you turn to Chavav, Pasuk Base 26.2, Chavav, Pasuk Base is the last Pasuk, if I'm not mistaken, in Bahar, all the way page 706. Now watch this, only to make the mix a little more exciting. At Shabtotai Tishmaru, again, the same terminology, right? What's the next word? Umikdashi Tiro. We're going to throw in a third thing, right? Into the mix. We had Kibbut Aveim and Shabbos. Now let's throw in what else? Mikdash. Beis Mikdash, right? My Shabbatot shall you observe, and my sanctuary shall you revere. I am Hashem. So now what do we have to ask? What does Shabbos have to do with filial responsibility? What does Shabbos have to do with Mikdash? And what is the word that connects them all? Tirau. So Rabbi Soloveitchik says we got to define what that word means. What does reverence mean? 
it seems to be fear, but it's reverence, which is used both in with the parents, right? At Shab Ish Imo Aviv Tirau, and then the Pasuk in Bahar at Mikdoshai Tirau, right? There it was. The same word. So what is Tirau? So the, the Rav takes us to a Gemara in Kedushan, Lamed Aleph on the base, and he, where the Gemara handle, handles the definition of two words. You've heard of Kibbut Aveim, honor your parents. What is, there's another word, Mora, Mora. What's Mora? Fear. Fear. What's, or reverence, awe. Two different things, the Gemara says. What's Kibbut? Kibbut is what we do for our parents in a physical concrete fashion. We take them shopping, we feed them, we wash them, we clothe them. That is all covered. What's mora? Mora, you don't sit in their seat. You don't contradict them. If they say something, you don't contradict them. The Gemara clearly defines mora as reverence, right? Kavod is a physical act that we do. Mora is reverence. Knowing this, it real, we come to a realization, mora, reverence, is a characteristic that should be associated with only one entity in the world, Hashem. We should have reverence for God, not reverence for a human being, not reverence, certainly not reverence for a place, an item, right? A, how do we have an object? An ob which object? The mikdash. How do you have reverence for a mikdash? That's an item. It sounds blasphemous. What you're telling me, we should have reverence for a human being. We should have reverence only for Hashem. We should have reverence only for Hashem. You're telling me that we should have reverence for an object, a building, huh? It doesn't make sense if that's what Mora really means. So the Gemara in Yevamos, Vav Amid Beis, Rabbi Soloveitchik says, addresses these two questions and notes that reverence in both cases by parents and by the Mikdosh are tantamount to showing reverence to Hashem. They're the vehicle to showing reverence to Hashem. The Gemara, the Rav quotes the Gemara in Kedushan, Lamed Aleph on the base that recounts that Rav Yosef, the Amora Rav Yosef, when he would hear his mother's footsteps coming, he would hear, he was in this room, she was in a different room. He would hear down the hallway, his mother coming, the Gemara says, he would jump up on his feet, stand up, and declare awe and reverence to Hashem. Awe and reverence to Hashem. When I hear my parents coming, I feel the Shekhinah is coming. That's, that's what Rabbi Yosef said. What? No, 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 no. no. So the same is true when we think of the Mikdash. We stand in awe, not of a building. What do we stand in awe? That is, Shekhinah is present there. Okay. If this is so, then we, we realize that Shabbos, reverence for parents and reverence for Mikdash have one connection, have one item that connects them all, which is reverence to Hashem. They all are vehicles to reverence to Hashem. When I observe Shabbos, when I show reverence to the Mikdash, when I show reverence to my parents, really, what am I doing? It's a vehicle for Reverence to the Shekhinah. One further point the Rav makes. Fear and love, can they live together? Fear and love, can they live together? No, they contradict each other. If you're in fear of a person, then you're not in love with the person. You can't be in love with the person you fear. But what about awe and love? Yes, awe and love work beautifully together. You can be totally enraptured with reverence for somebody and love them very, very much. Um, truth is, we can't have that feeling at the same moment. We can have a love and an awe for, for a person. When do you do that? When do you have love and awe for a person? When you realize the person that you have your relationship is a great personality, right? The Torah never commands, interesting, Rav Soloveitchik says, does the Torah ever command us to fear our parents? Never. There is no mitzvah in the Torah that we should fear our parents. What do we have? And by the way, there is no mitzvah in the Torah that you have to love your parents. There is no mitzvah 
that you have to love your parents. But what do you have to have? You have respect, that's correct, and reverence, right? Respect and reverence. Now we know what the difference is. So you can fear, no, you can't fear and love, but you can love and revere. You can love and revere. Both, but, but that is what Kibbut Avim is all about. Similarly, our love for Hashem is supposed to grow out of love and awe, not love and fear. There's love, there's fear for Hashem too. There is fear for Hashem. But love comes with awe, not with fear. Okay? Very, very important lesson that we're being taught by Rabbi Salavetrik about Kibbut Avim. As, as an aside, we're, we're being taught also about Shabbat, right? And we taught about Mikdash. So what did we see? Shabbat, Mikdash, and Kibbut Avaim are vehicles to our connection with our Kabbalah Baruch Because we don't see our Kabbalah Baruch right? But we have a love, we have an awe. So how can we have reverence for a human being? So what's the answer? How can we have reverence for an object? Because these are the vehicles for our, our sense of presence of the Shekhinah. Let's continue on. We'll take questions at the very end. Ve'et Shabtotai, Ishimov Aviv Tiro, Ve'et Shabtotai, ladies, plural or singular? Plural, okay. Ve'et Shabtotai, Tishimoru, and your Shabbatot, you shall observe. What? You shall, right? Hmm. What's being offered here? What? The Rav wants to know why he wants to understand Shabbat. So he different. He, he doesn't. He's he's poetic. The Rabbi Soloveitchik is very poetic in many of his presentations, mm -hmm. but he's not Heschel. The Rav it, it, Heschel is warm and fuzzy. If you've mm -hmm. ever read Heschel, he's warm and fuzzy. The Rav is profoundly thinking through the halachic system, and halacha gives him his philosophy. So let's see what the Rav has to say. The Rav begins by quoting a Zohar. You have to know something about Shabbos from the Zohar. The Zohar focuses on the fact, you see the Rav's spectrum of knowledge is, he can take it from everywhere. So in not only from Gemaras and Halacha, he'll take it from the Zohar. The Zohar says on Parshas Truma that Shabtotai is plural. That means how many Shabbatot are there? There are two because there are two different types of Shabbos. The, the Zohar calls it Shabbos de la Ela, Shabbos in the heaven, and Shabbos de la Tata. What's Shabbos de la Tata? Shabbos on earth. There's a Shabbos in the heaven and a Shabbos on earth. There are two aspects of Shabbos, as you're gonna see. When Adam and Chava were in Gan Eden and they sinned and they ate from the fruit that was forbidden to them, what happened to them? They were cursed. HaKadosh Baruch Hu cursed them, right? They received actually four curses from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We don't realize, but they received four curses after they ate what they shouldn't have eaten. Curse number one, it's back in Bereshi's Perikimo, Pasuk Yotes. With the sweat of your face shall you eat bread. The first curse is you're going to work hard. You're going to work hard. The second curse is not only you're going to work hard, but your work is going to be endless, uninterrupted, pointless work that you're going to be doing too. Sometimes we do a lot of pointless work. The third quote, curse, he's, the Rav calls it itzavon. You know what itzavon means? Man has a fear. He suffers in society called competition. A person needs to earn a livelihood. He's always worried. He's always frightened that someone will take his possessions away from him. That's itzavon. That's the third. You work hard. You got to work hard, right? You got to work by number two. You got to do endless and uninterrupted, sometimes pointless work. Number three, you're worried. Will you be able to hold on to your possessions? Right? It doesn't always end up that way. And number four, there is the curse of mortality. You're going to die. That's what happens with Adam and Chava, right? If this, if this is correct, then what this means is that Adam and Chava were cursed after eating the forbidden fruit to suffer continuous, exhausting, pointless labor that is by its very nature unproductive, resulting in conflict and ultimately in death. 
doesn't sound too very positive, right? But it wasn't. That's exactly the first, the first story in the Torah after, crea after creation. What's the tikkun? What's the refua? What's the cure to these curses? That's correct. Shabbos. Shabbos rectifies all four curses. This is what the Rav notes. The curses are Sunday through Friday. Shabbos comes along, Shabbos rectifies the curses. The first lesson that Shabbos teaches us is that it's a relief from the curse that work is that work can be dignified and, and it can be ennobling as long as what? You know when to stop. Some people, a lot of people, the world around us doesn't know when to stop. We, Shabbos is a lesson in knowing when to stop working. God taught us by a lesson and God com completed on the seventh day his work, right? Uvayom Ashvi Tishbos. Hey, Hashem stopped. Hashem stopped. Hashem stopped. We imitate God, right? By imitating God, stopping our work on Shabbos, we are released from the monotony the jealousy, the rancor that follows Sunday through Friday. Suddenly, it's the tikkun, number one. Shabbos also teaches us that endless work estranges people from those whom they love the most. The Torah commands that on Shabbos, family rests, family get, gets together, right? Ties between parents and children are renewed on Shabbos. Don't we know that, right? Shabbos is a very special time for that. That doesn't exist Sunday through Friday, right? That's the curse. Shabbos is the tikkun. Number three, the Rav notes, the curse of competition and alienation comes to a halt on Shabbos. The Rav refers to a fantastic story in the Gemara in Sanhedrin, Samachei on the base, about a river called Sambation. The Gemara tells an Agadita about a Sambation. Sabation was a very dangerous river, the Gemara describes. It was, turb the turbulence was unbelievable. It was like a hurricane all the time in the Sabation, except one day. Which day? Shabbos. Shabbos, you could cross the Sabation because suddenly the turbulence stopped. Only Shabbos did the turbulence come to a halt. The Rav notes, this is a reflection of the idea that on Shabbos, it has that type of an impact on our life. Sunday through Friday, it's turbulent. Shabbos, it's, no, it's the Zohar's Shabbos dilatata. The Shabbos on earth takes on that unique experience, right? Finally, Shabbos also addresses the fourth part of the curse. What was the fourth part? Mortality, we're gonna die, right? But Shabbos is called what? Not only Shabbos of this world, me'ain olam haba. It's a taste to the world to come. The Mishnah and Tamid reads the following. Mizmor shir liyom hashabbos. The psalm of the song from the time to come. That's how the, Gemara, the Mishnah explains. What does mizmor shir liyom hashabbos mean? For the day which will be entirely Shabbos, the rest of eternal life. That's what Shabbos is all about. When the Torah writes, and God saw all that he created and it was very good. It was very good. Only one thing gets tov ma'od. It was very good. When does he say that? On Shabbos, no. At the end of creation, number day number six. What is called? the unity of the world. Before the chait, there was unity, there was peace, there was everything. But then there was the chait and what it caused, and what did it cause? Tumult. Suddenly, all of this, all of these curses occurred. The coal was removed. Comes along Chazal and says, once a week in your bracha, in your tefillah, you change it. It's called Hashkivenu. We have a bracha in Meirut, Hashkivenu. How do we end Hashkivenu on Shabbos and Yom Tov? Ufros aleinu sukas shlomecha. What's ufros aleinu? And you should spread upon us the sukkah of shalom. What's the sukkah of shalom, ladies? 
The sukkah of shalom is the unity of life. When do you get that? Not Sunday, not Monday, not Tuesday, not Wednesday, not Thursday, not Friday. When do you get that? When Shabbos starts. Suddenly, the river Sambachion settles down. Our lives are the Sambachion. That's the point. Our lives are the Sambachion. When? From Sunday through Friday. Rabbi Soloveitchik used to recount that he lived when his father, Rabbi Moshe Soloveitchik, was the rod in a town called Hasselovich. And they, Hasselovich was in white Russia, and they warned them that the cause that uh, a group of murderers were, they came, somebody notified Rabbi Soloveitchik the night, the night that the murderers were supposed to come, a few hours before they came to town. And they said they were coming to town and they would go to the rabbi's house first and they would kill the rabbi and his family. Moshe Soloveitchik got his whole family, right, the Rob's families, his mother, his father and children, onto wagons and they went off to Warsaw before the slaughter happened because they, if they would have stayed, they would have been killed. So they settled in Warsaw. So Rabbi Soloveitchik lived in a section where the Mujits Hasidim were. And he would, he, he would go Shabbos afternoon by Sudash Lishit. Have you ever been to Hasidic Shittish? You better be willing to have a lot of patience. Hasidic Shittish on Shabbos afternoon, they don't, we, we announce 8.31, Davening is, Shabbos is over. 8.31, Balabatim one Shabbos over. What about the Hasidim? No, 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 no. Here it goes. So the, the Rav describes this. He says, he goes to the Majitzer Shtibel and he says, 8.31, if you will. <laughs> what are you guys waiting for? So a Majitzer, who he knew from the week, was a laborer. What kind of a laborer? This man was the one who carried all the peckles. You know, if you needed to move a piece of furniture, it was his back was the moving truck, you know? And he had, he was a poor, poor man. And his begodiman during the week, Sunday through Friday were torn. But he had a nice bekesha for Shabbos. He would dress for Shabbos totally in a different kind of a bekesha. So he turned to Rabbi Soloveitchik, who, who was a young man. And he says, you wonder why we keep Shabbos going? Where are you running? Where are you running? To the turbulence of the Sambachon? Sunday through Friday is the turbulence of the Sambachon. We're kings and queens. And this is what he said to the Rav. We're kings and queens on Shabbos. I become a laborer Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Why do I want to run to that? I want to remain a king and a queen. That's why I stay with Shabbos. I don't rush from Shabbos. And that's the halacha. The halacha says, Tosefet Shabbos. What do we do? We bring in Shabbos a little early and we don't rush out of Shabbos right away. Right? We try keeping Shabbos as long as possible because Shabbos is what? Is the response to the curses that Adam and Chava received in Gan Eden when they sinned. They brought turbulence to the world. Chazal said, You want the tikkun? You want to rectify the problem? What is it? It's Shabbos. That's what Shabbos is all about. I just read a fascinating essay that appeared online. You can get it in Wired. It's called, Wired is a magazine online all about uh, technology. It was entitled the following, Why Your Digital Shabbos Will Fail. That is the title. It's subtitled, Secular Shabbat, Shab Sabbaths May Be Trendy Self-Help Tool, But They Won't Cure Your Screen Use or Provide a Quick Fix for your stress. It was written by a woman, Kel Kelsey Osborne. She defines herself as a person, she's a Balachuva. She became from, she's an Orthodox Jew. And what does she write? It's a fascinating article. I, I saw it, somebody sent it to me and she's responding to the numerous essays that have been appearing over the past number of years. I remember seeing an essay very similar to this years and years ago on the United Airlines magazine. You know, each airline, they stopped, by the way. They no longer have magazines now because they decided that it was too costly. But United Airlines had a magazine. And there was an article by a person, this goes back 25, 30 years ago, the person suggesting 
that even non-Jews should go back to the Sabbath mode, if you believe the Sabbath mode is in our refrigerators and our ovens. But now you should go to the Sabbath mode in life, right? What is the Sabbath? And, and, and it describes, take a day off. That The Orthodox Jews get it. That's what the article wrote. So now everybody is so addicted to these wonderful phones, right? To these wonderful, it's true, right? We're addicted to them. You go everywhere, we're addicted to them. No, no, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking, oh, no, I, you had the phone, Khalila. I don't mean you. I got it in my pocket too, you know, but we're addicted to, we're addicted to computers. You know what the happiest moment in my, in my week is? Erev Shabbos, when I turn this thing off, I turn it off all week long, it's on. Erev Shabbos, I get to my, to my computer and I turn it off and I close it. Matsoi Shabbos, I open it up all year long. Here we go. That all Shabbos, it's closed. So they're so addicted to technology today that everybody's writing, how can we get the kids off? They're addicted to it. It's crazy. So they're suggesting why don't, numerous articles like this. You Google, you'll find numerous articles like this. That's what she's responding to. You think that you can imitate the Sabbath. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. It'll only work if you, this is what she writes. This is her punchline. It's brilliant. It'll only work if your Sabbath is rooted in religion, in God. If your Sabbath is not rooted in God, it ain't working. Two things she points out, by the way. Your Sabbath has to be rooted in God, and your Sabbath has to be rooted in community. You can't succeed if your Shabbos is done alone. You know, you'll do it in your, by the third week, you're finished. But we're not finished because we're part of a community. Everybody is doing Shabbos, right? We're all doing Shabbos. We're doing Shabbos Friday night. We're doing Shabbos lunch. We're doing, we're doing Shabbos. Oh, she says, that's not what this suggestion is, right? The secular suggestion is we're going to imitate Shabbos. We're going to close down our computers. We're going to close. That's not what happens in Shabbos. It's an excellent article. She, you, you'll totally, totally relate to it, you'll resonate, it'll resonate with you. She says, it's not the answer to technology's rest. It's an answer if you believe in God commanding you to rest, then it works. It's a brilliant insight. It's that Shabtotai Tishmaru. Okay, next, Pasuk. The Rav takes us to Pasuk Yud Tes A. Right here, when you slaughter a feast offering, a shlamim, a feast peace offering to Hashem, you shall slaughter it to find favor for yourselves. You shall slaughter it for it's. It's fascinating what the Rav notes here. He's watch this. Look. At, no, it's in other words, this possible this, to God, but also for you. Right. But so take a look at what's happening in these psukim here. You have this. How would you describe in your own handwriting, if you will, on a note and a paper? How would you describe this halacha? This is a ritual halacha, right? It's a ritual halacha. It deals with mikdash, shlamim, karbonos. Go on to the, go on to Pasuk Yud base. What's that puzzle? Don't swear my name falsehood. Is that ritual? No, that's moral, ethical. So what you have here is a fusion. This is what the Rav points out. Here, in one aliyah, what do you have? A seamless intertwining, right? Pasuk by pasuk, one pasuk, another pasuk. Sometimes it's a ritual. Sometimes it's an ethical. Sometimes it's between God. Do you ever notice that? Sometimes you have mitzvos here mixed together. Mitzvos ben adam la chavero, mitzvos ben adam la makom. Mitzvos that are dealing with your fellow man and mitzvos that are dealing with God. As if they go one, 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 one after the another. It doesn't matter what order they're in. They're just in one big mix. That's halacha, exactly what the, the Rav notes. He's fascinated by this halacha of the prohibition, the ethical laws, like Pasuk Yud Aleph, of the prohibition not to steal, not to embezzle with the, 
halachos of the sacrifices and of achieving holiness. So the Rav notes, in Judaism, holiness isn't limited to ritual. You don't find holiness only in the synagogue, only in the mikdash. Where do you find holiness? In the marketplace, in the street. That's right. When I treat my fellow man the way he's supposed to be treated, that's holy. Holiness is in Judaism. The Rav used to say, Hashem has to be in shul. He has to be in your dining room. And he has to be in your bedroom. And he has to be in the marketplace. He is everywhere. The, I pointed this out last night in the Gemara Shir. We're, we're dealing on the Daf Yud Aleph and Tanis. The whole debate is what is the best way to achieve holiness, if you will? Is it abstinence? Is it fasting? That's what the Gemara is dealing with. Is, is it an appropriate a route to achieve holiness by something? I wake up this morning, I say, you know what? I'm, I'm, in, a, uh, uh, I'm in a spiritual uh, uplifting mood. I'm going to fast today. Is that the route to achieve or no? That maybe is not the appropriate way. The appropriate way is to really enjoy the world that God gave us, but use it the halachic, via the halachic requirements. That's right. Spend your day learning, doing chesed, but taking care of your physical needs, right? Eating, not don't fast. That's the Gemara deals with that. So I pointed out, Rabbi Lamb, Zichon Bracha, used to note this very, very well. He said, in Orthodox Judaism, there is nothing such concept of secular. Secular, there is tuma, there is, there is, but secular, meaning nature, is nature secular? Not at all. That's Yad Hashem. That's Yad Hashem. I'll give you a, a, a proof. One of the mitzvahs that you have to do a Chodesh Nisan is what? Brichasa Ilanos. What's Brichasa Ilanos? A bracha, you see the new tree sprouting flowers ready to blossom. What are you supposed to go there? You weren't supposed to say, you're supposed to go out with a sitter and you say a beautiful bracha. Nothing in the world God has you, have you, uh, ha, 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 is missing in this world. You've given it to me, everything I need. That's what you say. There's nothing missing in this. You've made it all for my benefit. There is no concept. Yes, you have to know how to say, this is too much. Yeah, this is filth. Yeah, that, that's, but, the secular, what we call secular, is not secular. Is math secular? Is no. Is science secular? No. Is even English literature secular? No. Good English literature. I'm not talking about the trash. Good English literature, good literature is not secular. You can see Yad Hashem through it. You can be inspired by that. That's what you got to do. That's what the Rav points out here. You watch Kedoshim, watch this Pesukim. It's like a seamless unit one to another. Who was, this, who was this competing against, if you will? Who is this, I, I, I should say, who is the anti this philosophy? Christianity. Christianity believed that religion belonged in ecclesiastical areas, meaning in the church. That's where you're holy. They don't have a concept of, you know, that which is due to Caesar, give to Caesar. That which is due to God, give to God. That's not what we believe. That's anti-Jewish. Anti-Jewish, they split the human existence into two parts, where this, there was the secular on the one hand, the Rav notes, and there was the ecclesiastical. When you divide the laws in such a way, the Rav points out, danger exists that in human conduct will surface. If you don't, find holiness in everything you do, it, the danger that in human conduct will exist. And the Rav tells the following story. I, I read the Rav's words. I once read a short report by a German journalist about Franco. Remember Franco from Spain? Okay. He portrayed Franco as a sincerely devout Catholic, which he was, a religious person who actually enjoyed religious services. He would go every Sunday to church, Franco. 
He went to church every Sunday, prostrated himself on the floor, banged his forehead against the cold stones of the church and whispered, not by, not my will, but thy will shall be done. This is what he would do. He would act like a pious sadik, right? However, as soon as he emerged out of the shadows of the church, from the semi-darkness into the sunlight, he signed a death sentence for a young girl who was caught reading illegal literature. No, no problem for him to sign the death sentence. He came out of the church. It's a, it's a dichotomy. It's a contradiction. For us, it's a seamless flow from Ben Adam la Chavero to Ben Adam la Mokom. That's what the point, the, the Rub's pointing. Moral schizophrenia was resented by Judaism, the Rub notes. We must not separate the theological faith from the moral normative system. Morality cannot be separated from faith. Worship of God cannot be separated from morality. That's what Kedoshim is doing here in these psukim. Next, go to Pasuk Zion. He teaches us an interesting halacha, the Torah tells us. Pigul. You know what pigul is? It says, in, in this case, it says, if you eat the food after the, the korban has two days to eat it. A day and the next day. Fine. And by the third day, what are you supposed to do? Burn it, what's ever left over. If you violate the laws of the korbanos, that's called pigul. Also, pigul is when I bring a korban, I have to have the right intentions. If I do not have the right intentions when I bring the korban, the korban is nullified. And that's called pigul, okay? Doing inappropriate things with the korban, not following the laws of the korban. And pigul means the wrong intentions. So what the Rav is fascinated by this pasuk because what korban are we talking about here? We're talking about a shlamim. What's a shlamim? A peace offering. Are you obligated to bring a shlamim? Never. It's totally voluntary. So you know what the Rav notes? Why would the Torah put pigul, which applies to all korbanos? There are laws that are associated with korbanos. When you violate the korban, the laws of the korban, what happens to the korban? It becomes violated. It has to be destroyed. It's worthless. If you think you're bringing a korban and you think the wrong intentions, what's the halacha? The korban is nullified. It can't be brought. Why would you teach this halacha of pigul that applies to all korbanos only? Why did the Torah place it by shlomim, which is a voluntary a voluntary korban. So the Rav said the lesson is profound. When I do things voluntary, who do I think is the balabas? Mm. Yeah, of course. I'm the balabas. You didn't demand it of me. I'm giving it. Except why I do voluntary. So what's the Torah teaching you? Even when it comes to voluntary acts, when it comes to halacha, you have to follow the halacha. The, your voluntary gift is worthless if you decide that you are the one who's going to invent the law. Give me an example in the Torah, Nodav ve'avil, right? Nodav ve'avil brought a beautiful thing, Neish Zara, a straight, what did they do it for? for? For beautiful reasons. They wanted to become as close as a human being could to Hashem. There's only one problem. No, that, no, no, whatever, the, well, that, that's the Gemara comes along and answers. But simple reading of the Torah is what? Simple reading of the Torah is that they wanted to become close to God as much as a human being could. And that Aish came along and destroyed them. Why? Because they were people, if you will, right? They weren't instructed to do it. Oh, you're not, you, you can say, hey, one second, they did it voluntary. Yeah, voluntary, that's why the Rav notes. Pigul is in particular in this pasuk in Shlomim. Then finally, we're going to end with a fascinating halacha, pasuk Yudalid. You know this pasuk well. Lo sikalel cheresh, velifnei iver, lo sitein nifshol. Right? You shall not curse the deaf, and you shall not place a stumbling block before the blind. Okay? Why? You should fear God, for I am Hashem. What's Felipe Neyiver Losi Tenyashal? What does that mean? Before a blind person, 
you shouldn't put a stumbling block. Is it taken literally by Chazal? No, not at all. Really, naiv lo sitem yashov means what? You come to me, I have knowledge of a good investment. I have a knowledge and you want to benefit from that good investment. You know, I have that knowledge. So you come to me and you say, listen, here's $100,000. I want to invest in X, Y, and Z. And I know, you know, I don't know. What am I? I'm an e there. I'm blind. And what do I do? I give you bum uh, directions. I don't share with you what you should and I say, no, no, don't invest it in this. And I tell you, go invest it in X, Y, and Z, which is not a good investment. What have I done? If naiver lo sitem mishal, I put a stumbling block in this. In other words, what's the ever here? Is it physical blindness or is it blindness in knowledge? It's blindness in knowledge. It's blindness in morality. It can be blindness, not a physical blindness, but a blindness that you don't know something. So it's, yeah, I call it blindness in knowledge, correct? The Sefer HaChinuch wonders the following. Tell me, would I violate the leaf if I put a stumbling block, a real block, in front of a real blind person? And what's going to happen? The guy is walking down the street and I put a, a, a rock in front of him. He's going to go tumbling over. Is this possible? Then violate it? That's the Sefer Achinov's question. Oh, is I get what Chazal did with this Pasa. Chazal saved Livneiver Lo Site Mirshon means you've given a wrong bum steer. You, he does not know, you know, and you gave the negative rather than the positive information, right? It's going to hurt him. What if I really take a stumbling block and I put it in front of a blind person? Have I violated this Pasa? And the Sefer Achinov says, no, you have not. This is not about, oh, you've done something terrible, but this, this pasuk you have not by, violated. So the Rav wants, wants to know, what's the Sefer Kinuch doing? It's violating a major principle. Ein mikra yodse midei pshuto. There's a principle in studying Torah. The mikra, the text, doesn't, doesn't leave its literal meaning. Its literal meaning is what? Putting a stumbling block in front of a blind person. How can the Sefer Achino said, no, you haven't violated this? Listen to what the Rav says. You know what the Sefer Achino is teaching us? Chazal believed the Torah would never have put that in the Torah. Don't you dare put a, blind, a, a stumbling block in front of a blind person. Why? Because who would ever do such Thank a you thing? very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. It is so outlandish. It's so terrible that the Torah says, we're not doing that. Anymore. If you don't know that, you don't deserve to be alive. That's basically what the Torah is teaching us. The Torah expects us to be good human beings. The Torah doesn't have to teach me, no, that I can't put a stumbling block. As the Medrash and Bami Baraba Parshas Naso notes, if a Jew acted this way, if a Jew, you would see a Jew outside with a blind person and running in front of him without the blind person knowing and putting something in front of him that he's going to stumble over, the Medrash says we would investigate his Jewish lineage. Is he a Yid? He can't be a Jew. He can't be a Jew. He, that's what he did. He can't be a Jew because the Torah was addressing the Jewish people. It was a totally unnecessary to explicitly list the prohibition of hurting a blind person. If naiver lo site mirshal is not a person blind physically. It's a person who doesn't have knowledge and you, oh, that, that happens in business, unfortunately, way too often, right? You give the guy the wrong information and he gets hurt. He gets hurt. We see it all the time. He gets hurt. That's what it is, but not this level. So just to wrap up, the, the Rav noted, first of all, Kedoshim to you, the opening pasuk is the introduction to it all, not how to observe the mitzvot. I mean, not what to do, I'm sorry, not what to do. What to do are these, all these psukim as you go through Kedoshim, right? What's Kedoshim to you? How to observe it? What's your mindset? Your mindset is that the mitzvot have to be a vehicle to Kedusha, right? There are vehicles 
to being holy. They're our vehicle to having a relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And notice in these mitzvah, is there a list of Ben Adam La Chavero and a list Ben Adam La Makom separate? Not at all. They're mixed in one after another. They go from one to another, with another, another. Sometimes it's a ritual. Sometimes it's a Ben Adam La Chavero, right? is right next to Shlomim. Bringing Karban or Shlom, what does that have to, what does one have to do another? It does, because our morality is not divided between the ritual and the moral. It's all one. It's all connected. The, which leads us, of course, that, and we get so upset when we say it's such a chilul Hashem, when we see, quote unquote, a from person getting caught for unethical behavior, right? When we see the picture of the guy with the big yarmulke being arrested because he didn't act morally, he didn't act ethically in the business, we cringe. Why do we cringe so much? Because he's violated everything about this parsha. He didn't, he, he's not kiddoshin to you. He didn't learn the olive base, that it's connected, that there's a morality that connects not only, and I guarantee you that person with the big yarmulke, he, will he eat anything but glak kosher? No. Will he eat anything but chal of Yisrael? No. Will he even wear cotton sitzes? Oh no. He needs wool sitzes. It's a machlok, is it cotton and wool, right? I wear cotton. But you know, it's fine. Uh, but he, he, oh, he will only do that, right? He'll only do all of the rituals. He'll, his kzayas on Pesach is a real big kzayas, right? He'll only eat Shmura Matzah's handmade. He'll never think that machine made. All of the chumras, all ala chumras. And where was the chumra of being a mensch? He did, he would violate it, right? And that's the chumra Hashem. That's what this Kedoshim is teaching us. It's all one unit. So we went through a number of different mitzvahs. Rav Soloveitchik was fascinated by Shabbos. What is Shabbos? Tish Shabbatotai. There's two Shabbos, right? There's the Shabbos of heaven and the Shabbos of earth. And you're supposed to fuse both of them. And Shabbos is the tikkun to the curses that Adam and Chava created by violating the prohibition that we learned, right? And then we went on and we saw, what else did we see? We saw beyond Shabbos, we saw, um, we talked about, we, we talked about uh, the fact that it's not only Shabbos, but Shabbos and Kibbut are the aim. What do they have? And Mikdash. And these are the vehicles to encounter. And then we talked about Pigul and then Leif Okay? I'd like to ask yeah, you please. about the word Torah, because we benefit from being all of some reverence. Things. Yes. Reverence. But I look at it on the but I can put anything right. because this is. Even to be in awe or reverence, there's some fears in it. The no. word tira is to fear. No, tira'u is, so that's what the, the Rav is pointing out. No, tira'u it, by fear is an emotion that's negative. By tira'u, by reverence, is not an emotion that's negative. It's a positive emotion. It's, a, it's I stand in respect. That what generates that response that I have tremendous respect. That's what it is. In other words, am I fearing my parent? Mora is my fearing my parent, or I have respect for my parent. When I don't contradict my parent, am I fearing that my dad is gonna go me, whack me on my face? Or no, I have respect for my parent. Where should it come from? Tira'u is mora, is a, a respect for my father. I would never contradict my father because that is inappropriate because it's gonna look like I have more knowledge than he does. That's not from my fear that he's gonna patch me. I hear you, so how do you explain or make it to help to understand the result of the sentence that says, Al-Tira, Al-Tira, yeah, 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 yeah. A word can have many meanings. A word can have, yeah, it matters in its, its, in its place. That's what the brother's point of at Shab Totai Tira'u, or um, no, as Avive Imo Tiro, the Chapter Tai Tishmoru, 
excuse me, es aviv imo tirau, does not mean that you're worried that your Abba and Ima are going to patch you in the Panim. No, rather that you have respect. Sometimes that word can have a multiple meaning, right? A word can have a multiple can meaning. I have one more thing to think about the, the name of the parasha. If I was told correctly, I think to find that the word Kadosh is actually separation. That's Rashi. Rashi, Rashi, Rashi says that. So. Also, this parasha also is a separation. Because here is what we need to separate ourselves from all the stuff, from all what he said. There. Yeah, there, that's how Rashi understands it. Yeah, in, in separation, yeah, 100%. No, nobody contradicts him. Rashi says, how do we achieve Kedusha? Prisha, we separate. Yeah, okay, there's validity to that. Yeah. Pigle? I'll give you an example, people. Well, no, my question is like, then the meat, does that still go to the Kohen? No, 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 no. So it has to be so, destroyed. So the yeah, so but like if, if the halacha says, the halacha says this korban is going to be, it must be eaten one day and one night. Yeah. One night and one day. And you say, in, when you bring, I'm going to eat this over two days. Now what is, what's happened to the korban? It's people. In other words, you're violating in your mindset. Did the coin No, you, you. If you have to be honest with yourself. Oh, so uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah, of course. So then the carbon. If you tell the if you tell the coin out loud, you can realize right away. So within yourself. Yeah. So this is totally up to the individual. Usually, it's quite it's often. Done. Yeah. So so that, but, but yeah. The, the way that it says here also, and maybe you can. I hope that I'm yeah, sure. go ahead. It says later when the nefesh it's me that if somebody eats it, one can get sick because all the nefesh is correct. Correct, but but for illness because if you okay eat something that is not spiritual old. illness, not not physical illness. We don't see people. Lightning doesn't strike from heaven when a person is mechal shabbos, right? Correct. So at what point does this happen? Oh, that's that's the whole debate in the Gemara. What does kares mean? You have many uh, suggestions on what kares means. Does he get wiped or get she get wiped out of history, of Jewish history for turn for eternity? That's the debate. But what does kares mean? There's a big, there's a whole Gemara Krisus on what's kares. It's a whole Krisus on what's kares. You know, it's a whole debate. We, we really don't know what Kari says. One thing I'll tell you, it's not a good thing. <laughs> you don't want to do things that are Kari. There are only two positive commandments that if you don't observe, usually Kari comes with a negative commandment. If you violate a negative commandment, you can get Kari. Like Pigal, right? That's a negative thing. Don't do Pigal. Oh, you did Pigal? Okay. But a positive commandment, not a doing not keeping Shabbos doesn't get not um, not not eating um, what I'm sorry I am Kipper I am Kipper that's that's a negative you're not allowed to eat so you would be violating but there are only two positive mitzvahs so if you don't do them usually positive mitzvah you don't do you didn't do okay but you, there are two mitzvahs that if you don't do you get kares do you know them? Mila, if you don't do Mila on a baby boy, that's Kares. And if you don't bring Karban Pesach, if you don't participate in Karban Pesach, that's Kares too. Those are the two mitzvahs that are positive that get Kares. And the Kares for a boy is the one, the parents or the Well, child? eventually the child becomes obligated, right? The ch child becomes obligated. It makes sense. Because by making a statement that I'm not going to participate in this community thing, you really, you yourself have made the decision to cut yourself off of the community. That's correct. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. Okay. Thank we'll you. continue next week. Uh, Thank you. Rabbi, Rabbi, yes. Rabbi, I have a question for you. Yes, Shelley. Hi, how are you? It's Shelley Rube. I enjoy.